Hi everyone, welcome to the latest edition of our State of the Consumer webinar series. Today we'll be focusing on unlocking the power of generational spending. For any newcomers to our State of the Consumer webinars, we started the series back in March of 2020 and have been pulsing consumers ever since. We've talked about everything from the financial crisis to digital retail to the future of streaming. And today we're going to be looking at spending across generations. To start off today's program, I'm going to take a deep dive into a recent consumer survey that we ran to uncover the spending and saving habits across generations. And after I share the data, I will welcome two special guests to the virtual stage to share what they're doing in their own work in this area and talk through some practical applications for generational marketing. For those who have not met yet, I'm Katie Gross, Chief Customer Officer here at Suzy. And what exactly is Suzy? We're an end-to-end -end consumer insights platform that combines quant, qual, and high-quality audiences into a single connected research cloud to help companies grow through customer obsession. And the study that we're going to use today was conducted on Suzy on April 28th to 1,000 US-based consumers, <clears throat> and it was census-weighted across age, gender, ethnicity, and region. And coming up a little later in the hour, I'll be joined by two great speakers, John Cannon, Senior Strategist at Merkley & Partners, and Shalini Sahi, Insights Lead for North America at Pladis Global. And they'll be joining me for our discussion portion of this webinar. So let's kick this off by level setting on who our different generations are. And so for the purposes of today's results, Gen Z is being defined as anyone ages 18 to 26. And while this demographic technically includes those aged as young as 11, we kept our survey questions to those 18 and over. And millennials are 27 to 42. Gen X is 43 to 58. And boomers are 59 to 77. And we're going to be looking at spending across these generations to answer a series of questions, including which generation is the best and worst at saving money? What will different generations pay more for? How do different generations want brands to make them feel? And what does brand loyalty look like across those different generations? And how do brands, how do different generations start to discover new brands? So question number one, which generation is the best and worst at saving money? So across the board, our generations all said that they think that Gen Z is the worst at saving, including Gen Z themselves, <laughs> and taking a qualitative look into why they think this, respondents shared a range of answers, including perceptions that they haven't yet developed a culture of saving, that they're being brought up in an age of mass consumerism, and that they live on DoorDash and want instant gratification with material goods. And what we actually learned, however, is that Gen Z is actually the best at saving money, at least right now, 11% of Gen Z save over half of their income, and that's compared to only 4% of millennials, 3% of Gen X, and only 2% of boomers. And according to recent headlines, Gen Z is really saving savvy overall, and they're stashing away on average 14% of their income for retirement. Whereas boomers, on the other hand, are not necessarily saving money. And as mentioned, only 2% of boomers save over half of their monthly income, one in four only save one to 5% of their income, and 17% don't save anything at all. I'm sure that many served much, saved sorry, much earlier in their life in order to live on the interest, live on the dividends, and so on. So they're not necessarily saving for the future. But just because they're not saving doesn't exactly mean that they're splurging on luxury vacations. Boomers actually spend 24% of their income on the essentials, which is significantly more than any of the other generations. Gen X reported to spending 14% on essentials, millennials 8%, and Gen Z only 3%. So now that we know who is saving, let's move on to question number two. What will those different generations pay for? And this may sound like a stereotype, but it looks like there's some truth in that long-standing rumor that millennials are fans of little treats. According to our data, they're willing to pay extra 
for pretty much everything. In fact, they identified as being more likely to pay more across the board for brands and products that are innovative, sustainable, organic, viral on social, well-known, designer, adherent to high labor standards, liked by their friends and family, in alignment with their values, and more. In fact, there were so many categories that they identified as being more likely to spend more money on that we actually could even fit it onto this one page. However, in contrast, Gen Z are the least likely to pay for well-known brands. And what's the number one thing that all generations will pay more for? It's a brand that they can trust. So moving on to our third question, we're going to look at how different generations want brands to make them feel. And the results were unanimous across generations. They want to feel satisfied, happy and pleased. And looking at this generation by generation, Gen Z are the least likely generation to care about feeling healthy, informed or supported because they just want brands that make them feel good about themselves. But in juxtaposition, millennials want brands that make them feel seen. They identified as wanting to feel trendy, feel empowered, brands that make them feel energetic, feel healthy, feel informed, and feel excited about the purchase. And Gen X, also known as the forgotten generation, and don't I know it, the classic latchkey kid, just wants to feel supported by brands. They're tired of being overlooked, and they're also concerned about being unprepared for the future. 61% of my generation actually expressed concern over future financial security. And where do the boomers fit into this? They're actually the polar opposite of millennials, with only 6% of them saying that they search for brands that make them feel trendy. Which brings us on to question four, what does brand loyalty look like across those different generations? Big meaty topic. So while there's not a one size fits all trend across generational loyalty, two categories did rise to the top. All four of our generations reported being loyal to brands when it comes to groceries and personal care. I know that I personally cannot live without my Olay face wipes or my Red Bull or my Maybelline mascara. So personal care and grocery brand loyalty is definitely high for me. And in addition to being the least concerned about how brands make them feel, Gen Z are also the least brand loyal and 18% of Gen Z are brand loyal against any category at all. So who is the most loyal to brands? That will be my fellow Gen Xers. So only 9% of Gen X reported a lack of loyalty in any of the categories. And 48% of millennials expressed a likelihood to be most loyal to electronic brands. Now, given that that generation actually grew up during the electronic boom, it does make sense that this is an area where they are particularly brand loyal. And boomers are spending money on their pets. 37% of boomers reported to being very brand loyal when it comes to pet supply brands. And the common loyalty threads amongst generations are products value for money and how reliable and effective they are. Our younger generations are influenced by good customer service. So if a brand provides good customer service to them, they are more likely to stay loyal into the future. Whereas our older generations are staying loyal to lower prices. When we layer in some of the other data that we presented this afternoon, this stat actually makes a lot of sense for them. Gen X reported to being worried about financial security and boomers put a lot of their income towards their everyday essentials. So therefore it does make sense that these two cohorts in particular are looking for price savings where they can find them. And then on to our last question, how do different generations discover new brands? Through friends and family, all of our generations reported that this is either their number one or their number two way of discovering new brands. But Gen Z, and millennials are, of course, also turning to social media. Instagram is still at the top of the social brand discovery for both millennials and Gen Z. And TikTok continues to be a fast rising platform for brands. And it's currently the third way that Gen Z discovers new brands. 
And millennials are also reporting Facebook as the place for brand discovery. As for Gen X and boomers, they are still seeking discovery via more traditional channels. Both reported to learning about new brands in store and via commercials as some of the top ways for discovery. So what have we uncovered today? If you're a brand that's looking to win across all generations, it's important to do a few key things. First, emphasize how trustworthy your brand is. Obviously, authenticity in this is vital. Then focus on how you make consumers feel. They all want to feel satisfied, happy, pleased. Finally, make sure to deliver value for the cost of your product and make sure that it's always reliable and effective. We're also going to round up what we've learned by each generation. So if you're a brand looking to win specifically with NG, sorry, within Gen Z, this is what you need to know. As a reminder, they are the best at saving money in a savvy way. They're most interested in brands that make them feel good about themselves. They're the least likely to care about well-known brands and they are motivated by value, reliability, and good customer service. Our key learning for this cohort is that they really don't care about brands. And I love this cartoon on screen, which really exemplifies this belief. What do we know about Gen Z so we can get them to buy more stuff? Well, so far we know that they hate brands that try and get them to buy more stuff. <laughs> So we've really seen uh, you know, de-influencing as a trend across social media, and this really supports it too. So what's the so what for Gen Z? Don't focus on the brand, focus on them, focus on the consumer. And a great example of a brand that does this really well is a skincare brand called 4AM. They're an aspirational brand, but their focus is very much on their consumer. They talk about being skin minimalists, and they want you to do less with skincare and keep a focus on yourself. Their brand name, 4AM, is a nod to encouraging consumers to indulge, to be themselves, drink the wine, eat the pizza, go out all night, and then do your skincare routine. They've got you. I will say as a Gen Xer, I'll warn the Gen Z that eating pizza, staying out all night till 4AM will eventually catch up on your skin. <laughs> so on to our millennial summary. We found that some generational perceptions are true. And the millennials are willing to pay more for pretty much everything. They're also the most willing to try new brands, as long as those brands make them feel empowered and align with their many values. Similar to Gen Z, they are looking for value, reliability, and they want their favorite brands to provide a good customer service. And our key learning here is that millennials will pay a premium for brands and products that align with their image. We have a couple of funny tweets that highlight this exactly on screen right now. So what for millennials? Millennials want to be sold a lifestyle, not just a product. And an example of doing exactly this is Lululemon. While the product they carry is yoga clothing, they're also selling an aspirational lifestyle to their consumers through their advertising. And now looking at Gen X, they are the most likely to be, a, to be brand loyal, but also the most likely to be worried about money. As they sometimes are the forgotten generation, they also tend to be left behind and out of brand marketing strategies. So our learning for them is that they are not only forgotten, but they're also pretty stressed out. In order for brands to appeal to this generation, they need to make them feel supported. In keeping with the forgotten generation theme, it was actually really challenging for us to try and find examples of brands that really support Gen X's needs. One that we did find, however, was insurance company Allstate. With this great tagline, you're in good hands, to their familiar ad campaigns, they help consumers feel and seen and feel supported. And last up, we're gonna summarize boomers. Boomers have a lot of expenses, and not a lot of their monthly income goes towards savings. So when they do spend, they want reliable and effective products that are good value for money. They're less concerned about trends and feeling seen by their favorite brands. And as this generation retires, they're definitely prioritizing substance over style. For them, the goal is to focus on the quality of the product, 
not how trendy it may be. And this is a pretty big strategy juxtaposition to some of the other generations. An example of brand marketing in this cohort is Mini, which all of my boomer neighbors are driving at the moment. This is an absolutely great tagline. You don't need a big one to be happy. Ooh la la. All right, so now we've unlocked and uncovered the secrets of generational spending. I'm gonna invite my special guests on stage to chat through some practical lessons around this. So Shalini and John, welcome to the virtual stage. Hi, thanks. Awesome. John, would love you to introduce yourself to the audience, your role and who you work for. Yeah, hi everyone, I'm John Cannon. I'm a senior strategist at Merkley & Partners. I primarily work on the Mercedes-Benz business. Awesome. And Shalini, introduce yourself to the audience. Hi everyone, I'm Shalini Sahi. I'm the head of insights at Plata's Global for America. And I um, work on brands such as Turtles and Flips, chocolate covered pretzels. Awesome, fan favorite over here for, for both of those products. <laughs> All right, so let's get into it. Let's start unpacking the data. Let's start our today's discussion by taking a deeper look into data that we uncovered. And one thing that may have surprised viewers is that Gen Z is still doing a major amount of savings. So what do you think about what we're seeing here? We start with you. Um, I mean, I think it maybe it was a bit surprising to see it first, but it actually makes a, a ton of sense to me. If you think about it, this Gen Z is a generation um, that had a front row seat for two recessions and kind of their entire lives has been marked by this sort of like long periods of uncertainty and rising inequality and political polarization. So to you know, crave that sense of security, safety, peace of mind, um, I think makes a makes a ton of sense to me. And I think the fact that they're able to save is great. I think, you know, when the 2008 2009 recession happened, um, and a lot of millennials were kind of forced to move home uh, because of a bad market, I think it's made it a lot more acceptable to sort of take your time before going out and, and like fully sort of like living in the world and, and, and spending. Um, so I think it, it makes a ton of sense. Yeah, absolutely. I know my sister's preparing for her boys to live with her for well into their 20s, and it's <laughs> really acceptable. <laughs> Another thing that was interesting in the data was that people like shopping for groceries, both in person and online there. What are your thoughts there? I know it's not necessarily your category, but do you think that home cooking could be like a pandemic holdout? I mean, it again makes sense to me. I spent a lot of time during the pandemic scrolling TikTok for various through various viral recipes. Um, and I think grocery shopping can be like a really practical way of treating yourself and staying on trend, like seeing what other people are doing, sharing experiences, that sort of thing. Um, and it's it's just like maybe a, a fun way to express yourself without with at relatively low stakes. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and as a Gen Xer, we tend to be the forgotten generation. But that being said, it felt like everyone was talking about millennial shopping patterns um, when they're still fairly new to the workforce and uh, or when they were still fairly new to the workforce. And now that they have more money, we've moved on to talking about Gen Z. So I'm curious if you think there's a benefit to nurturing generations before they can spend or if brands should today lean into the target consumers who have um, you know, their wallets with a little bit more at the ready today. What are your thoughts there? I mean, I think it's it's obviously it's very important to focus on your today customers, but I think we also see a ton of value in sort of priming the funnel and setting yourself up for success down the road. I know that when, you know, millennials were the the shiny object in the sort of the marketing room and people were all very excited to, to court this next young generation, we saw like the entire weight of organizations shift um, their, their portfolio strategies to court, start courting millennials. And I think we're seeing maybe a little bit less of that now, um, but people still, you know, see that feel the need to start courting, uh, courting Gen Z and like priming, priming the funnel, even if I mean, for my category specifically, Gen Z are not going to be are unlikely to be the Mercedes customers of today. But hopefully, if we if we play our cards, right, they, they will be the customers tomorrow. Yeah, absolutely. Shalini, what are your thoughts on this topic? 
Yeah, so I'm probably in a very unique position where Gen X is not forgotten at all for our brands. Um, Gen X parents are at the core of our consumer targets for both uh, Turtles and uh, Flips. I think Turtles is a prime example of why nurturing prior generations is super important. Um, you know, I, I think many people are familiar with the brand um, because of its longstanding history. It's been around for 107 years. So we've seen Turtles be a fan favorite throughout many generations. And, and really what's um, very beautiful about it is there becomes a very ritualistic kind of pattern that gets passed down generation to generation. So maybe it's not an everyday product in homes, but we see it being used for very special moments across numerous generations. And what's even more special is a lot of uh, the generational uh, consumers that we speak to today, they never forget their first bite of turtles because it's linked to such a nostalgic memory. And that's something that we tend to pride on and also um, really leverage as a benefit in terms of our messaging and un uncovering new opportunities for the brand. Yeah, that makes sense. Obviously, the research showed that products that are effective are important to all generations and turtles are delicious. So they always deliver. Yeah, and what's great is I know that you touched on really uh, product quality and di and differentiation for different generations, and it's and word of mouth and recommendation being through family, and that's something that we have the benefit of because our longstanding history of just a premium quality product. So, yeah, yeah. absolutely. I know for me, I use it as a mood boost. I really it makes me feel great. So as we pivot to kind of thinking about priming the uh, luxury consumer funnel, John, let's transition into uh, talking more about your work specifically. Can you share more about how your work at Merkley and Partners, especially as it pertains to kind of priming that luxury consumer funnel? Um, yeah, so I work um, I work on Mercedes sort of across all of the, the various um, lines of business there. So I work on passenger car, I work on vans as, and CPO as well. So throughout those sort of different business streams, we see um, we have to cater to sort of all, all the different generations, but we're seeing, especially in sort of in vans and in, um, in certified pre-owned, we're seeing a lot more younger customers sort of come into the fold. Um, and, uh, so one of the things, one of the uh, a study we actually just conducted through Stu Susie was all about trying to understand how Gen Z um, thinks of luxury sort of as a category uh, on its whole. And I think we found some some really interesting stuff there about how they're how they're thinking about luxury and really how kind of inexperienced they are when it comes to the luxury category, which, again, I think makes sense. They're they're young. Yeah, sure. Usually when we think of like Mercedes Benz, my mind automatically goes to that older consumer. Um, or I actually think of Eminem and Dr. Dre singing about Mercedes Benz as well. So what type of research are you doing um, you know, to build that funnel for the future luxury consumer? Um, right. So I think one of the things we wanted to do is, again, understand how Gen Z thinks, feels and sort of approaches luxury. And I guess surprising or, or not surprising, we found that again, most of them were pretty inexperienced. I think 62% of those interviewed hadn't had any sort of luxury experience in the last year. So they hadn't made a purchase. They hadn't been given any sort of gift. And then the vast majority, the majority of those that had any experience had maybe one. Um, so again, they're, they're really inexperienced with it, which really help kind of skews the way they think of it and define it. I think people that, uh, people that have a bit more experience with luxury, um, are more, are more quickly to define something as luxury. If it's high quality, if it's thoughtfully designed, if it's seen as really innovative and with this younger generation, like far and away, the most, uh, sort of like distinct, um, attribute that they align with luxury is price. So it's purely price driven. None of the sort of like quality or characteristics that fall underneath like the price and exclusivity really shine through. So I think one of the things that'll be really interesting for us to see as uh, this generation has a little bit more buying power and a little bit more experience in the category is how some of those other sort of like luxury attributes start to evolve and and what what which of them they they tend to value yeah 
for sure. It must be challenging then to kind of make sure that your marketing appeals across generations. Is that something you're focused on or are you very much focused on kind of one or two? It, it, it is. I think we we spend a lot of time really trying to focus on who's going to who's gonna be buying our cars. So, But we ultimately, we do try and keep our fingers on the pulse of what's happening. We try and look at everything we're doing. If we, any research that we have, we try and cut uh, and look at through by sort of the various generational cohorts and you know from there we can try and repeat what we see working obviously and learn from what doesn't um i think one of the things we're, we're able to do in looking at we we run a couple of different brand tracking studies um that we get to sort of see how how different generations sort of fluctuate over the year and respond to, to different brand marketing. And one of the things we're seeing there is just how well Gen Z has responded to Tesla, which is, you know, not a traditional automotive brand, but one that has sort of made a pretty big splash. So just, just even knowing that the next generation is um, not just okay with, but excited by a non-traditional automotive company is something sort of interesting for us to to learn from and, and grow with moving forward. Yeah, for sure. Um, it must be really so hard in the automotive industry for a new brand to break in. And I think Tesla has definitely done a really good job of, of building the trust um, as well. Um, so thinking about how how you kind of test campaigns. So we talked about, you know, does your marketing appeal across generations, but how do you actually test those amongst different um, audiences and then bring them to your stakeholders? Charlie, is that something that you could folks do over at Pladis? Yeah, definitely. So we do a lot of testing uh, with Susie and shout out to Kaylee, my partner. Susie has been amazing. Thank you so much. Um, she really has been awesome, an amazing partner with us. Um, you know, contrary to what John's speaking about, about how, um, you know, Gen Z's are very excited about non-traditional offerings. We are a traditional offering on <laughs> Turtles. And so apart from, you know, showcasing and understanding what product benefits we can share to boomers for millennials and Gen X who really care about how the brand speaks to them, um, we really have leveraged Susie on how we can speak to our consumers about not only product, product benefits, but how the brand um, comes out in life and how um, maybe the brand is linked to, I can't give too much away, but how the brand, you'll see the campaign later this year, but how the brand may emote um, in the world. And if, if the brand was a famous person, who would that famous person be? And how sophisticated does that come across versus um, how traditional or how old fashioned um, we, you know, younger generations are looking at turtles today. Um, and we also do leverage Susie for a lot of ad testing. Again, shout out to Kaylee, who was amazing, who helped me really test our flips campaign that's out in market today and really making sure that our consumers are not only understanding what this flips everything means for them at different generations and different consumers who actually purchase the product versus eat the product, um, but as well really help uncovering how can we boost up our activation to ensure that we're really hitting more down the funnel, the traditional funnel of brand, brand metrics. Yeah, that makes sense. I'm excited for the future campaign. <laughs> Um, so thinking about moving over, moving from just kind of brand awareness to real kind of brand love, um, and obviously, Charlie, you work on both flips and turtles, as, as you've mentioned. Could you tell us a little bit more about the kind of different marketing approaches that you take to each of those brands? Yeah, so um, obviously, a lot of the generations care about getting the most value for the money, especially considering the Russian recessionary context that we're in today. Um, and we know that's more of a focus on particular generations than not. Um, that being said, there's multiple ways that we come into marketing towards the different generations. So uh, we really are tapping into emotional well-being for both flips and uh, turtles. Very different spectrums, though. And if anyone wants to Google the flips campaign video, it's really about our Gen X uh, parents who are on a road trip and they flip into a roller coaster. And it's really about mood boosting and tapping into that energizing piece and understanding um, 
it's it's more about understanding what the brand is speaking to you and capturing that memorability when they're at shelf versus turtles will you'll see in market it's really about focusing on your mental well-being and giving yourself a break but in a very new and differential way that we've really tapped into focusing on and really focusing on how um, we are our, a reliable effective uh, product experience that has been long standing and it can translate to new generations that don't have that everyday experience with our product. Yeah, absolutely. It's that satisfied, happy, and kind of pleased that we, we heard about earlier yeah. for sure. And then always kind of the brand like Turtles, most consumers are really familiar with it, but don't necessarily think of it as like that item to grab on the snacking aisle um, on every shopping trip. So how do you kind of create that messaging around it and try and move it into that kind of everyday favorite category? Yeah. Uh, if anyone has strategies on that, let me know, because I'm still in learning mode on that one. Um, but really, you know, partnering with best in class partners to help us uncover everyday pain points, apart from the snacking behavior, just everyday simple pain points of our boomers, our Gen X parents, um, and some millennials as well, and really uncovering reasons to why we have uh, opportunity to believe in turtles in those moments. Mm -hmm. And then acknowledging those folks and helping them feel supported within those pain point moments is something that we really want to um, showcase with our brands. Yeah, that's so great. You've really taken the research to, and applied it um, as well. Yes. Flips is, of course, on the other hand, um, a great everyday favorite, as you mentioned. Now I'm going to have it on every road trip. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about the, you know, the specific demographic? You've mentioned Gen X there, but how have you kind of dug into those demographics for that particular product? Yeah, I think anyone who takes a look at Flips, they innately believe it's actually Gen Z that's consuming us more often. But this is really interesting because we notice, of course, Gen X parents are gatekeepers for their children. They do a lot of the purchasing. They're heavily influenced by the younger generations, most definitely. But what's special about Flips is um, the product benefit and the intriguing aspect of a unique uh, salt and sweet snack. Um, really allows parents to purchase the bag for themselves. Um, although they may intend on purchasing for the family, it's too delectable and they just dig into it right away and tend to consume it uncontrollably. So I highly encourage that. Um, it's really great and, and a, um, a fun product. Um, and then once they're introduced into the brand, there's also this special phenomenon how our Gen X parents um, tend to buy the larger pack sizes for forced sharing occasions. So these are occasions where, oh, I know I have to hang out with my kids on a Friday evening. It's movie night. Yes, I'm excited for the movie, but I don't want to share the snack. I'm going to choose a snack that I definitely can chow down on, but also share. And, and those are those forced sharing of moments that we really um, take a look at and, and uncover as opportunities for us to really uh, deliver a great experience on. I love your use of the phrase uncontrollably snacking on <laughs> there. It's definitely uh, me with a bag of flips. Um, fun fact, sweet and salty together is really not something that's a, a that's a, on the palate in the UK. So when I first moved to yes. the USA about 10 years ago now, um, sweet and salty combinations, I was like, this is amazing. <laughs> so very excited for flips when I discovered them. Um, so speaking of that, <laughs> and, and people's love for kind of sweet and salty, how do you turn brand awareness into kind of brand love? Yeah, I think it's just about speaking their language. And, I, and by language, I don't mean English or French or any languages that we speak. It's more so how do they really connect with brands and what are they speaking about today? And, and it's not about going viral. It's about building a true connection with your consumers, building trust with them through both product experience, but also trusting that you're going to put out innovation or communication that excites them and makes them remember that this is something Something that fits not only for themselves, for the people that they really care and love about as well. Um, and, and can be something that they pride on as well as being part of, you know, the Flips fam or Turtles um, heritage fam as well. Yeah, awesome. All right, so let's think about kind of the future consumer. Um, so what predictions, if any, do you have for the next wave of consumers that are like now just entering that workforce? Um, and John, we'll go back to you if that's okay. Yeah. Uh, well, I think the first thing that I think it's exciting and it's, I 
become evident, I think, over the course of the last few weeks and then or the last few years and then see, seeing this presentation especially is that Gen Z are f like sort of finally starting to be thought of as not just like younger millennials. People are starting to see them as like having their real own carved out identity. And I think brands are starting to figure out exactly kind of how to cater to them um, and not, again, treat them just like older millennials. So I think, again, the brands that that work that out the best and and develop those that like that real sort of like trustworthy relationship um, with them and, and, and be the ones that get recognized for seeing Gen Z for who they are um, will be will be really successful. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, and how do you think that some of those kind of buying patterns as, as more Gen Z you enter the workforce and more kind of boomers retire out? Do you think that's going to affect your categories in particular, John? Uh, yeah, it, it should. I mean, I think we're for Mercedes, we're still we're hoping boomers buy cars for a little while longer. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, you know, the, the down to like the, the types of vehicles that are produced and vehicle preferences changing will certainly affect, you know, affect Mercedes going forward. Um, and I think it'll be really interesting to see how how the younger generation responds to um, to a brand that is, I think, becoming more and more of a luxury brand versus like a, a, a mass appeal brand. Yeah, for sure. Um, and then Quinn, what kind of advice do you have for those that are on the call that are trying to kind of work on their own brand strategies right now about identifying who their key audience kind of, who their key segments actually are? Charlene, what are your thoughts on, on how to help our, our audience here? Yeah, so, um... I think a lot of companies are definitely focusing on segmentations based on consumption or demand and whatnot, and that's great, but you should really be focused also on consumer uh, strategy. So really identifying who your target today is, who's at the core consuming it, I, understanding who do you halo out to, and then identifying for the future, taking a look at future trends. We understand which populations are growing, um, understanding which ones prioritize what kind of messaging and, and really building out a pipeline of which consumers you believe would be opportunities for and preparing for long-term strategy, honestly, through both uh, innovation and communication and then activating against that. Yeah, that's really important. We actually have a lot of clients right now doing a lot of driver analysis and you know, very dynamic segmentation work with us right now for exactly that reason. Um, and how do you kind of bring build brand loyalty against it? So not just for your brands, but how should companies think about building brand loyalty within a target consumer? And Charlene, I'll touch uh, back to you again. I think that um, the most important way to drive loyalty is to surprise and delight from any brand out there. And that may come across by what product services you offer or um, new opportunities uh, that come up. I think what brands special brands are doing today are really providing a break from the perma crisis that we're experiencing um all generations are experiencing i think many of us are tired of uh conflict in the world that you know on numerous levels that we are either hearing about or experiencing ourselves firsthand and we really just need to be delighted it's way more than just satisfying through joy it's a deeper level that brands need to speak on and and show up for our consumers today and really provide an, an amazing experience that is going to be transformational through whatever platform you choose to yeah that's awesome well that was kind of all of my prepared questions but we have a huge amount of audience questions and i'm just filtering through right now and there's some really fun ones that i'm going to start with which is what are some of your personal favorite brands or products and how did you become aware of them? And are you paying attention to trends on different platforms, et cetera? John, I'll start with you. Any kind of personal favorite brands or products? Ooh, putting me on the spot here. Um, let's see. I'm going to, I'll go with, uh, I'll go with Patagonia. Um, I think I've just as, as a marketer, they're, they're a brand that's like just so easy to respect but they have such a, like a clear brand identity, clear image, but I think just, and then as a consumer, they're, they're again, a, a brand that's just been so great at building, building trust and building like a real relationship with, with the people that buy from them. So I'll say Patagonia. 
interesting. Shalini, what about yourself? I have way too many and my desk is full of everything. So I will show and tell. This is like an amazing <laughs> question. So um, as someone who lives in the US with Canadian and Indian heritage, I get to travel a lot. I have a lot of affinities. I obviously love Tim Hortons, staple brand for Canada. The quality of the product, no comment if there's anyone on there, but it's something that I grew up with. I also travel quite a bit to our UK office and always pick up Fortnum and Mason. Um, I love the packaging. It, it, I'm a sucker for the packaging, also the quality of the products. Um, and it's what super widely available. In America, I love, and I think Canada as well, is Sage. It's a wellness brand, um, and I'm very heavy into lip care and, and love the offerings that they provide, the way that they message. Their SRM is so awesome. Um, love the unique uh, product experiences that they provide through a series of the products that they do. And then um, I'll stop there because I could go on and on. If anyone ever wants to hear about other brands, please ping me. I would love to share everything. Oh my goodness. My personal favorite, which everybody in my office knows, is definitely Red Bull. And I think it's one of those nostalgic brands that it kind of came to market in the mid 90s in the UK. And it really got me through my final exams at high school, my university exams. And I've just been so loyal to it. And I think they've also stayed so true to their brand of it gives you wings we focus on drinks, we focus on giving you energy. And I've like always respected they just stuck to their core values. Um, and also being British, Tetley tea is my is my go-to. Again, probably nostalgia, but just quality products, just fantastic. Makes you feel like a warm hug from the inside. <laughs> um, Charlie, somebody in the audience had a question for you specifically around kind of marketing different products to different regions. So imagining that probably the Midwest might have very different snacking habits to like the West Coast, for example. So how are you kind of marketing to different regions? I'm so curious who asked that question. I wonder if it's one of my teammates trying to test me on our activation. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it, um, it is so difficult to, I think, depending on your brand, it's very difficult to identify what regions you are. I think certain brands are focused on, uh, regional marketing due to the fact that their production and distribution is heavily focused in one area of the country. And it's just physically hard to get your product on the other side and you find that as a fruitful opportunity and make something of it the other side of it is um and, and this is both scenarios that i'm in today the other side is there are particular ingredients that are high affinity in particular regions of the country so pecans are very high affinity in the south and that's somewhere where turtles does extremely well and so, and, and Flips is, you know, obviously loved throughout the country, but especially in Northeast because of um, our high presence there. I think the reality of it is, is uh, marketing in certain regions, yes, you can activate on it and you can really focus on uh, making sure that you're appealing to those regional consumers and customers developing for the palette there, but also realizing um, two major things. Number one is, remembering that COVID and post COVID has really created this migrational pattern of mm -hmm. folks who maybe lived in the Bay Area and moved back to East Coast uh, because of tech layoffs and, and unemployment, et cetera, um, or vice versa, depending on new opportunities. Um, so that's one and develop and under really understanding your consumers who are migrating and their preferences as they tend to infiltrate different parts of the country. The second piece is when you're really measuring the success of your campaign, choosing heavy up markets that you want to really dig deep into and that you want to invest even more into to understand the efficacy of your particular campaign activations or messaging activations and also testing in those uh, areas. So actually today, again, another shout out to Kaylee, uh, speaking with her, um, really trying to develop a way that we can test in particular cities actually to understand the efficacy of our um, activations. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, we have a question in here around kind of gaming and streaming, um, which I think is really interesting. So, of course, what we're seeing is that gaming and streaming are definitely kind of coming closer and closer together, tying together more, and appeals, you know, for everyone from Gen Z through Gen through millennials, kind of through Gen X, probably not quite so much boomers. So, are you seeing any kind of significant opportunity for brands to build awareness through streaming or kind of gaming avenues? And John. 
I instantly think of uh, Grand Theft Auto when I think of cars. Yeah. <laughs> um, but are you focusing on, on that kind of area at all? Yeah, no, it's really interesting. And I think it's, it's especially interesting in the luxury space. I think like my initial thought would be those two things would clash, but we've already seen some like really respected and well-known luxury brands already start to sort of dabble in the gaming and, and streaming space. You know, you can buy uh, Balenciaga skins for your character and characters in Fortnite now. Um, and so it's, and we also see sort of just like collaborations with brands that already have sort of like built in audiences as a really sort of like fun, exciting way to branch our brand out and then sort of like bring new audiences in. Um, so I would bet you would see Mercedes in some sort of streaming or gaming um, sort of uh, atmosphere sometime in, in the future. Yeah, that makes sense actually. Um, does it apply to kind of food brands, Charlie? What are your thoughts? Yes, most definitely. I think if you look at um, any of the tween or teen kind of brands out there, shout out to my ex Jenner Mills friends who activated on you know the metaverse, um, the Reese's Puffs, um, and whatnot. There's a lot happening out there. A lot of brands um, are hosting specific events in the metaverse to encourage consumers to come and learn about their brand, but also just build brand affinity. But remembering that there's this major trend that's going to be coming up, um, it's like a fidgetal trend. So how do you really bring together the physical aspects of where we live in the world and who we are with the digital version of yourself or your digital interaction and being able to create a very interactive, fun snacks. I'm in the snacking category um, that really l lend itself in both worlds, something you can talk about, something you can interact with in the digital world, but also remembering the experience and also reminding folks, anyone who works in the snacking industry, that you may focus on your digital activation um, and having presence there, but remembering that when consumers have their headsets on and their, you know, VR hand things or whatever gaming stuff, sorry, I'm totally not hip and cool that way, <laughs> but they still have one hand going into a bag of their snack simultaneously and making sure that they're ever fulfilled with the product that they're experiencing um, through the taste sens sensation, multi-dimensional flavors and textures um, that really also is as exciting as the experience that they're having in, having in the digital world. That is awesome. And for anyone who wants to know a little bit more about kind of what does fidgetal mean, um, an example, we actually did a state, a state of the consumer about a month ago on fidgetal retail. So we can always check back to that as well. You mentioned um, the younger generation as well. Now, although we didn't necessarily conduct research on Gen Alpha, have you folks started doing any kind of face-to-face -face research on Gen Alpha yet? Anything you found? Or is that not really an area for you? Probably, John, I'm good imagining that for Mercedes probably not yet. But not, Charlie, not quite. <laughs> but any kind of Gen Alpha research yet, Charlie? Wait, actually, so two things. Gen Alpha research on a daily basis, Katie knows this and John, I have a two almost two year old at home. So I live that re <laughs> daily research yeah. and they definitely know what they want at an early stage and they copy everything that parents do. But actually John, um I was one of my neighbors has a Mercedes kid car oh yeah those are right great. so and and my and the and a neighbor of mine has a, a toddler dyson vacuum and you know i think yeah right and That's i think exactly what i mean when i say priming the funnel for yeah, yeah really, i would love one of those ship one <laughs> over i'll send you my address after um but i think it i think there's numerous things that go around gen alpha they know from infancy exactly what they want. I'm not joking about that. They're very attentive to um, what parents are doing or uh, people who influence their daily lives are doing. Everything from unloading the dishwasher to what they're consuming. Um, they also are very hyper aware of what brands are being consumed by other folks and how maybe parents like myself are giving my child an organic brand and she knows that I don't eat organic and she wants what I have. So really they're very attentive to everything. And I think 
you know, uh, the Mer Mercedes little car for the kids is very cool. I don't know if that translates to brand loyalty in the future, but uh, a nostalgic investment that you have to make in and reap the benefits out 30 years from now or 40 years from now. Yeah, that's awesome. All I can imagine now is you're treating an old Dyson vacuum in your house. <laughs> yeah, no professional experience on that segment whatsoever, just sharing my own personal observations. <laughs> awesome. Here's a great question, and obviously potentially unprepared, but do you have examples of brand where you kind of can think of some brands who've actually won back trust? I'm thinking back to kind of while you guys think on that, I'm actually thinking back to some trackers that I ran, I think it was 2009, um, when Toyota had a, a, an issue around their brakes failing um, in, it was like 09. And they immediately jumped on, you know, making sure they had kind of brand trackers across multiple countries. They tried a lot of different kind of PR campaigns to, to really win back that trust. Um, and they put a lot of effort into really understanding the different messaging um, to, to ensure that what, what works to kind of build back that trust in a, in a really authentic way. So I, I, that's kind of my personal memory of a, a brand that did a really good job, Toyota, um, after, after that concern in 09. Yeah. Any thoughts on you Slightly before my time on the brand, but I, I know about it just from from the the history of it. But similar to that, there was like I think back you know fifteen fifteen or so years ago, there was just some some questions about just like the the quality of the product Mercedes was putting out, and they started started to see sort of the quality ratings go down. And what they did was sort of like go back to go back to what sort of defined Mercedes as a brand and really doubled down on on safety messaging and and things like that things that could sort of reestablish the the again the the trust and then of course having the product to follow um, is is one way to do that but yeah I think doubling down on the things that sort of made Mercedes a beloved brand in the first in the first place um, went a long way to help sort of reestablish trust. Yeah. I think my comment here is more of a provocative comment to my fellow marketers and uh, CI folks that are on call, but um, I don't have a particular, I mean, I probably have 10 brands I could think about just on my desk, as I mentioned before, but um, you know, we're in a recessionary period where a lot of our focus as business professionals is focusing on revenue growth management or holistic margin management, whatever you'd like to call it. And really the first lever that you go to is product experience or supply chain efficiencies that in turn in, impact what you are providing to the consumer. I My provocative comment is try to not lean on that because we will get through the recessionary period and there will be a boom in the long term. Think of your long term strategy and invest for that in the future. So maintain the quality or increase the quality and uh, try to um, command a price increase through the product experience and packaging experience that you're investing in through this time period. Because a lot of companies are reducing their marketing efforts, their budgets, their lessening the quality that they're providing. This is your walkway, runway lane, whatever you wanna call it, sashay away and just make sure that you take advantage of it to set yourself up for a future ahead because this is the best time to brand build and loyalty build with consumers. I don't think that was controversial at all. I think that's absolutely <laughs> me. So I don't think we can better that comment. So, um, and we're coming up on time. So Shani, thank you for that uh, wonderful kind of ending comment. And thank you, John, as well for joining us today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Um, I hope that everybody has had a lot of fun, learned a lot on this call today. We'll, of course, be sharing out this presentation. Um, so I saw some comments in there about some slides people want. Don't worry, we'll be sending them out um, and you'll get a copy of this recording as well. So I hope everybody has a wonderful afternoon. And thank you again to John and Shani for joining me. And we'll see you all soon. Thanks. Thanks, all right. everyone. Thank you.